Okay, hi guys, my name is uh, Maurizio, and uh, I mean, let's begin by thanking uh, Marco for the, for the invite. Uh, I live abroad, so I was very happy when he told me that I could come and talk in Italy. And then he added, uh, the international audience is certainly gonna like it, so I had to, you know, switch back to English, but so it is. Um, so, um, uh, I'm gonna be talking mostly about uh, game development and uh, how we use C++ in game development, uh, you know, the good things, the bad things. Um, it's mostly very high level talk. Okay, so no code, uh, no questions for the audience, no stress. Um, so, let's get it started. The usual, uh, you know, what do you know about video games? Uh, I've been making video games most of my life. Um, been working professionally in the sector uh, till 2008 um, for the past five years. I was the CTO at a company in, uh, in Denmark making video games, uh, mostly the Hitman series. Uh, I'm currently on a sabbatical, so I'm enjoying some time off. These are the titles I've uh, shipped. I've also worked at Ubisoft, where I shipped Rainbow Six Siege, in case you guys are into competitive shooters. And then, as I mentioned, mostly Hitman, uh, Hitman titles. Um, I've been talking at uh, you know, international conferences, but mostly on gaming uh, in, the, in the past few years. Um, <coughs> And um, my background, I have a kind of an academic uh, background. I took a PhD in uh, computer engineering and I've been coding, yeah, since I was 18, pretty much. So I know the, I've learned to, to both love and, uh, and hate language uh, over multiple years. Uh, work kind of pushed me to also learn other things. So I've also been coding in C Sharp uh, pretty much for more than a decade. Um, okay, so let's talk about game development. Uh, when um, when people ask me what I do, and I go like, well, I make games, uh, usually the reply I get is like, oh, you must be playing games all the time. And uh, that's a myth, it's, it's not true. Uh, I mean, I wish it was, but it's not true. And uh, in, in reality, actually, games are pretty crappy until the very end. So it's not that enjoyable to play your own game while it's being, uh, while it's being made. So, uh, you know, usually I follow up by saying like, yeah, no, we don't really play games a lot. It's mostly, you know, coding. So I, I, I write software and, uh, and, and lead teams writing uh, software. And the, the general reply there is like, oh, okay, yeah. So I, I know coding, I've been a coder as well. I, I studied the HTML in school, something like, uh, something like that. And, um, and, uh, and so I follow up to kind of explaining a little bit more about that by usually making uh, an analogy with, uh, with Formula One. Uh, I know that Marco has actually worked on uh, at Ferrari, so probably he, uh, yeah, he knows what I'm what I'm talking about. So, point is that games development is to normal soft normal whatever that normal is software development a little bit like uh, you know Formula One is to consumer uh, consumer cars, meaning we're really really obsessed about performance. And to give you an idea of what I mean with that, uh, you know, uh, why I, I think that gap is so is so wide. Uh, let's take an example. Let's you know, let's do engineering. Let's let's just measure. So this is a screenshot from uh, Google Chrome. It's probably one of the uh, you know largest uh, C++ code bases out there, uh, built by uh, you know a very famous company, with uh, I guess a lot of uh, very well paid engineers. Uh, so let's assume that the bar is extremely, extremely high there, okay? And it's used literally by billions of people, so, uh, you know, very well tested and all that kind of stuff. Now, when you're looking at that white page with a, with a logo, uh, actually Chrome takes something like, you know, half a second uh, to just display that page. Uh, of course, there's a lot of network going on, so a lot of time is wasted just going on networking and all those things, but if you open up the internal profiler, the built-in profiler that they have, uh, you can see that basically it's taking something like six milliseconds uh, just to render that page, plus painting, you know, presenting to the screen and, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So all in all, you know, that white page is kind of taking seven milliseconds. Let's look at an example from, the, from games. So this is a screenshot from, uh, from Hitman 2. Um, in a Hitman 2 level, on average, there's something like 300 NPCs that are just walking around, minding their own business, and their intelligence, their animation, it's basically updated every single frame. Uh, there's also large crowds. Uh, it's a different system that you know, shows even more people. Uh, here we're probably looking at you know, some, some kind of additional few hundreds of, uh, of, uh, of crowd uh, characters. You have all the logic for, the, you know, for, the, for what the player is doing. Uh, I mean, in this mission, there's literally a race going on. So there's cars going by. Uh, those flags up there, uh, there's cloth simulation, making them uh, you know, move realistically. 
and, uh, and so forth. And if you're playing this on your PC today, it's probably running at 60 frames per second, meaning that uh, every single frame basically has around 16 milliseconds to do, to do, its, uh, to do its own thing. So when we put these two things side by side, um, basically Chrome is taking seven milliseconds to show you a white page with a logo. And uh, you know, a game is doing all those million things uh, that I've just uh, said in uh, barely a little, uh, little bit more. Uh, you know, a common joke is that if you're just looking at three web pages, you're actually uh, you know, taking longer uh, than what a, a game does on, uh, on, uh, on average. So um, again, this was just to reiterate that in, uh, in games development, uh, we're really obsessed about performance. Performance is really king in, uh, in everything that we do. Uh, most of our profiling tools, they literally measure in nanoseconds. Uh, um, you know, normal industry, sometimes they're happy when a website or an application uh, starts up in, a, in, a, in one second or two. Uh, most games these days, uh, they run at 30 or 60 FPS, and if you're playing on a fancy PC with, you know, unlocked frame rate, uh, it's, it's not that hard to have your game uh, needing to, you know, run scenes at 120 FPS or, or even higher. Um, again, compare that to, you know, the, what, what is considered responsive uh, for an application these days, which is 50 milliseconds, and you get an idea of how little time uh, games have to do what they need to do. So for that reason, we're pretty much uh, the, the industry is dominated by native uh, strongly typed languages, right? The, the, the only class that can really get us to the level of performance that we basically that we basically need. OK, more details about game programming. You know, how is the a day in, a, in the in the life of a game programmer? Uh, what tools do we use? Um, you know, in, in general, what are the things that we we, we work with? Um, when it comes to the hardware and the development environment, uh, making games is pretty similar to working on uh, embedded systems. Um, it's not really hard, real-time embedded systems, because again, if, you're, uh, if your frame is not consistent and you have a spike here and there, you know, no one is dying, so it's not as important like you know, hard real-time on a, on a medical uh, device or uh, on a rocket and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, gamers can be extremely picky. Uh, so, uh, you know, if your game is spiking during a multiplayer match, uh, someone will go on Reddit and claim that he lost because the game is shit and it was not optimized properly and uh, uh, that's why he lost and the game is bad, blah, 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 all that stuff, you know, uh, the internet, pretty, pretty much. Um, Riding on uh, on consoles for many many decades has been kind of a little bit of a nightmare because it was basically this very custom uh, hardware, custom CPUs, uh, custom architectures, and uh, so forth. Basically, up until the PlayStation 3 era, which was the pinnacle of unfriendliness, I would claim, it was really really painful to develop for those uh, for those platforms. Luckily, uh, since then, the industry has pretty much converged to x64 CPUs. And, uh, and, and pretty much PCs. If you buy a PlayStation 5 today or an Xbox uh, Series X or whatever they're called, it's pretty much a PC, uh, just with a, you know, with a fancy logo uh, and a little bit of sprinkles of custom hardware in the, here and there, but very, very little. So um, the whole uh, development process has largely simplified and, and even uh, most of the tools have kind of, um, kind of converged. Um, memory is, um, is a similar concern, meaning, again, back in the days, uh, these devices really had very little memory, so you had to be completely obsessed about your memory consumption, uh, your memory access pattern, all those things. Uh, this day, a console, you know, most major consoles are sporting gigabytes of, uh, of RAM. Um, it's usually shared between the CPU and GPU, and usually most of that memory is used for the graphical part. But still, uh, you know, it's not as constrained. Uh, the memory usage is not as constrained as it used to, as it used to be before. But uh, memory is pretty much the dominant factor in performance these days, unfortunately. So uh, writing games still is something that requires to be extremely uh, memory savvy or, you know, aware of how you're using your memory and how you're accessing your memory. Um, as I mentioned, tooling uh, used to be extremely, uh, you know, uh, varied. Uh, luckily, it has pretty much converged to, to Windows. Um, that's where the market is. Um, uh, so, uh, yeah, most of our tools, they pretty much run on Windows. Even when you're uh, uh, working on a console that does not run Windows, like PlayStation 5, which is pretty much running on a customized version of, uh, of Linux, 
you're still working inside Visual Studio and just cross compiling and all those tools have been basically made to 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 abstract the fact that there's a you know a Linux machine on the on the other uh, side. Uh, the Xbox consoles they're pretty much Windows again they run a custom Windows kernel but they're pretty much a Windows machine with almost the same Windows API and uh, and so forth. Uh, Stadia this cloud service that unfortunately is no more was also running on Linux but again same same story there uh, all the tools were abstracted so that you didn't really needed to bother uh, about those uh, those details. Okay. Um, Methodologies and adoption. Uh, um, I like to say that the game industry is re relatively young and unfortunately inexperienced, uh, meaning there's a lot of things that still needs to be learned and needs to be kind of, uh, you know, become standards and so forth. So there's a lot of variety in the way uh, companies operate or how they, how they run. Uh, you know, you see all kind of uh, methodologies from agile to waterfall and, uh, and so forth. Um, certain things that are, uh, you know, kind of typical is that back in the days it used to be a one-shot development, meaning you will be working for three, four years on something, you put it in a box or, you know, you burn on a, a DVD master or a CD master back in the days, you send it out and, you know, fingers crossed that everything uh, worked. You didn't really have any chance to, to fix anything uh, there. Uh, now, um, for better or worse, uh, the industry has pretty much transitioned to live services. Uh, so the good side is that games can be fixed even after they ship. The bad side is that there's less incentive to ship, uh, you know, games that are working. So games quite frequently are completely horribly broken on uh, on day zero. Uh, many games actually shipped on a uh, on an empty CD. Pretty much the CD is completely empty, and you're just uploading everything from uh, from scratch because by the time they get submitted, they are actually not uh, not done uh, yet. Um, I mean, there's some cool stories from back in the days where you only had uh, one shot, uh, meaning sometimes you had to, you know, fix bugs at the last minute on this very, uh, you know, obscure piece of hardware with terrible debugging tools, and you just had to to, to guess what was going on. Um, you know, some stories that I'm not proud of, but it's just part of the industry. Uh, I mean, once I was on a Sunday afternoon, pretty much trying to debug something. And uh, well, Monday we had a gold master, so I literally had to write some code that was if level name and if character name equals something, literally a string a string comparison, skip this piece of code. And it's it's just the reality of how development uh, is. Uh, again, now now it's it's not like that anymore. Thanks uh, thanks God. Um, when it comes to uh, adopting uh, both programming trends and uh, production trends, and uh, as I was mentioning. When it comes to production, the industry is, again, it's, it's re relatively young, doesn't really know how to do things, so we're trying everything. Oh, Scrum, yes, let's do Scrum. Oh, uh, super uh, crazy agile, let's do super crazy agile. Let's try to do this, let's try to do that. When it comes to technology, it's actually quite the opposite. It's almost like, I, I, I think we act a little bit like dinosaurs, meaning we're always one generation behind. So back when the when uh, you know most of software was written in C, uh, the game industry was dominated by assembly. People were still writing their games in assembly. Uh, then most of the people moved from uh, C to C++, and games moved from assembly to C. And now these days, where it feels that you know a good chunk of the world is uh, you know looking beyond C++, the the game industry is, is very strongly you know set in the in the C++ world. So again, uh, this is mostly a kind of a bullet point recap of the key aspect. I've already touched on the on the on the top two, so let me add a few words to the to the to the other points. Game development is an extremely iterative um, process, and what I mean there is, production are usually very large. Uh, there's hundreds of people working on it. And uh, there's this constant flow of, you know, forget about the design document or, uh, uh, you know, written requirements. Those things just don't, do not exist in, uh, in, in the game industry. I mean, you make them just to please publishers, but in reality, they're not really followed. It's a very iterative process where multiple disciplines are constantly giving feedback to each other. You know, a game programmer might implement something, a designer tries that out, uh, goes back to the art director, they get back to the coder, they want these changes here, that changes there. And, uh, and so forth. So um, this is this is how it runs pretty much. And this process goes daily, weekly, monthly, but it's basically made of this uh, larger and larger loops that keep uh, keep going. There is a um, there is a constant need to innovate because again, gamers and players they always want more. 
usually having a technology edge. It's a good way for your marketing team to have something to tell to the public. Um, so there's a lot of R&D going on, which is a little, again, it's a little bit silly that the, we are extremely conservative on the technologies we use, but at the same time, we are pushed on, uh, on trying a lot of new things to kind of compensate for that. Probably, I would, yeah, let's, let's say that it, the, the need to, to research on one side is probably what is uh, uh, forcing the industry to be conservative in all the other, uh, in all the other uh, aspects. Uh, productions are extremely large and extremely expensive. Um, not everyone knows, but the game industry is way larger than the movie industry. It's actually even way larger than the movie industry and the uh, music industry combined. Uh, actually, it's pretty much the largest digital uh, entertainment sector if you exclude uh, porn and uh, betting online. Pretty much those are the only two that really move more, uh, more money. But then gaming is pretty much the biggest thing that it's out there. Even if you take, you know, the most expensive movie, you know, Avengers and their, uh, their revenues, right? Those, they, those make billions of dollars. Uh, take GTA, Grand Theft Auto. Uh, Grand Theft Auto makes the money that Avenger uh, did in all their lifetime in a week. Okay, that's just to give you an idea of how big the industry is, meaning there's a lot of st at stake uh, and there's a lot of people working on, uh, on, on these things, which is why it's, um, it's an industry that is also heavily driven uh, by milestones and deadlines, sometimes set years into the, into the future. So forget about the, you know, being relaxed and working on a, on a mobile app and you just ship a feature when it's ready. Uh, no, in games you usually, you know, you sign a deal with someone big, they give you $100 million, but they want that game by that Christmas of that year because they, they have planned uh, their, uh, their releases uh, there. Okay. Now, um, one thing pretty peculiar, um, about the, the game industry, I mean, applies to other disciplines as well, but it's definitely something that is true for, uh, for us, is that um, we, we make a lot of our own tools. We basically write software to make our software. Um, so when people usually talk about the game engine, uh, in reality, they're referring to many different things. There's the, the real game engine, which is the piece of software running on the consoles or running on the PC once you ship, that it is actually running the game. But in reality, a game engine is much more. There's a ton of tooling uh, that you use to create that game, to prepare your asset, cook your asset, uh, you know, uh, handle communication and all those, uh, all those things. Um, again, um, a lot of game uh, creation these days is literally made in, in custom software. Pretty much if you exclude, you know, Photoshop, 3D Studio Max, uh, you know, some animation tools, uh, most of everything else it's done in, uh, in house, you know, all placement of objects in the world, all the setup for AI. Um, yeah, you name it, uh, pretty, except pretty much for creating uh, models and creating animations, uh, everything else is done in, uh, in, uh, in custom, uh, custom software. Uh, things are changing. Um, so commercial game engines are becoming more and more uh, available. There was a session just before about Unreal, uh, which is pretty common in the so-called AAA industry. Uh, AAA refers to games that you know sell more than a million or that cost more than uh, 10 millions. Let's let's put it like that. Um, and then there's Unity, which is very very uh, you know very very common and pretty much the dominant engine for the mobile in the in the in the sector. The the choice of engine it, it's usually kind of dictated by the by the size of the studio because uh, usually the size is also you know uh, connected to the to the to the size of the game that you can uh, you can do. Uh, I will claim that Unity is pretty much the dominant engine under a certain size. Uh, you know, small team one from the single developer that makes a more small small mobile games to you know teams of. Uh, even up to 50, making something a little bit larger, Unity is pretty much the dominant, uh, the dominant engine. Um, there's a large size, uh, you know, very, very large company, Ubisoft, Electronic Arts, Blizzard, uh, Activision, you name it. Um, and real is used there, but mostly uh, once you go above a certain number of engineers that you can throw at your tech, it makes sense to actually throw those engineers at your tech. Because again, it gives you an edge. It allows you to customize your tech to do exactly what you want to do. Uh, if you play, I don't know, God of War, uh, Last of Us, uh, um, um, Horizon, um, all these things, you know, they're running on their own technology pretty much. The engine has been made exactly to do what they, what they want. 
um, many of these large companies, what they do is basically make a, an internal middleware. So they make a large engine that is then uh, kind of used by all their internal, uh, internal studios. Um, programmers in the game industry, um, at, at least above a certain size at the studio, tends to specialize a lot. Uh, so it's very rare that you're just a programmer making games. It's very typical you are either a game programmer or an AI programmer or a render programmer or a multiplayer programmer. Online, tools, audio, you know, you name it. People tend to specialize uh, a lot. Um, there's a bunch of different languages using there. Again, uh, render programmers, they're probably the, the people still uh, being closer to the metal. So they tend to use uh, languages that are more... Uh, uh, you know, uh, adapt for that, and then people that are further away from from the actual running game. You know, people making backends, uh, people making uh, online leaderboards, all those kind of things. They're generally embracing, you know, uh, newer uh, newer languages. Um, yeah, uh, again, uh, about the actual languages uses uh, used. Uh, of course, C plus plus is the is pretty much the the the, the largest share. Um, I would claim that some games are written in C, but uh, what you see very commonly is that uh, people write in that subset of C++ that it's very similar to, to, to C. Uh, you probably find some assembly in every large, uh, large code base in the games, but it's usually you know, that single uh, hotspot in the critical loop of uh, you know, the, core, uh, the core part of the, of the game, or uh, you know, MAT libraries. MAT libraries are very frequently uh, handwritten in assembly to use uh, SIMD instruction and those kind of uh, things. Um, C sharp is very um, uh, it's it's quite uh, quite used in the industry again both because of Unity enabling people to write games in uh, in uh, in C sharp even though the core of Unity is actually written in C plus um, plus but also for the you know for the ecosystem around as I mentioned there's a lot of uh, custom tooling being made and those are usually made in uh, in C sharp. Um, you know, some people use Java. I'm sorry about them, but you know, um, scripting. Uh, so, uh, as I said, games are pretty much very obsessed by performance. But you know, you, since uh, since you really need to go hardcore on performance, you go hardcore only where it matters. And usually, it's you know, it's five percent of your code base that accounts for ninety percent of your uh, running time. So, a lot of uh, scripting languages are actually used for things that don't matter too much when it comes to performance. Like you know, for some designer to specify the logic of what happens when you press a button, right? Press a button, turn on a light. It's something that basically only happens once, or how a mission is uh, is progressing. Like okay, you kill this bad guy. Now you need to your objective needs to change to to killing this other bad guy. You know those things run a lot in uh, in visual uh, scripts. And then as I said, tooling. Um, there's a good chunk of tooling uh, written in C plus um, plus. We all know probably that it's not the nicest experience, but it's very easy to just stay on just one language, both for your engine and for your tooling. So Unreal, for instance, is a clear example, right? Pretty much the editor and the engine are actually one thing. Um, so it makes sense for them to, to, to have that single language. Uh, many engines are architectured with a very clear split between what runs on the consoles and what runs only during development. And usually there's also a language uh, boundary there. Um, some people try to use web technologies for uh, doing tools. Um, it didn't end well. Uh, yeah, there's a, I, I, I'll, I'll share some link. Uh, there's a presentation from a game company that really tried this. I think they tried too early. And they, they, they share horror stories like, you know, while in their editor at certain point, ads were popping up because they were using some library, uh, some JavaScript or, uh, you know, uh, Node.js package that was uh, bringing all these things into their, uh, into their app. Anyway, uh, I think that is changing now because uh, WebAssembly is making it more viable to actually run, you know, use a real language and still deploy in, uh, in, the, in the web. Um, so I think that's, uh, that's, that's changing, might, might be changing. OK, finally, C++. So how we use C++ in game development and how we don't use C++ in game development. So uh, there are certain things uh, that are used extensively. And um, I will claim that most game code base these days, they are at least on C++ 11. Uh, many on C++ 14, and probably the people that are more forward-looking, they are on C++ 17. 
uh, quite frequently you are held back by the version supported by the by the platform compilers. Okay, so if there's a, if there's no uh, you know, PlayStation compiler for uh, C++ 20, well, you're stuck with uh, C++ 17 and stuff like that. Um, this is a list of, I mean, templates have been used forever pretty much in the game industry, even though many coders hate it for reasons that we're going to talk about it later, but they're pretty much, uh, you know, ubiquitous. They're, uh, they're everywhere. Um, Lambda and Move Semantics were probably the, the first two things that were adopted in um, largely from the C++, uh, from the C++ uh, 11 uh, standard, pretty much. Lambda, because games have been uh, doing concurrency and doing pretty much handmade lambdas for, for ages. Uh, again, I worked on Unreal Engine 3 in, uh, 20 years ago, and they already had their own lambdas, pretty much. It was some kind of weird macros that you had to do. So when lambdas were fully introduced, they were uh, adopted very quickly. And move semantics, again, uh, for performance reason, it makes uh, code so much uh, better and faster. So it has been uh, uh, adopted uh, a lot. Um, you see auto used uh, mostly sparingly. Again, people still, for, for this large code basis, people really tend to favor reading over writing. So uh, many people use auto where it's very easy to infer what it does, uh, you know, what type is really there or for either readers. But, you know, it's not that we go all crazy and use it everywhere. Um, a little bit of STL for algorithms is kind of accepted. And, uh, yeah, variadic templates is also something that I've seen massively uh, adopted. There's a lot of stuff of C++ also that we do not use at all. Uh, they're kind of uh, seen as... Uh, uh, yeah, poisonous. Um, STL is, uh, is probably top one on that list um, for multiple reasons, compile times and performance. Uh, STL allocates uh, memory even if you just look at a variable and uh, it's, it's just a, a net of including everything, uh, so it impacts uh, massively your, uh, you know, your compile time. Uh, some companies have even uh, gone so far uh, to basically make their own uh, STL replacement. Uh, you can find for uh, EA STL online, it's a version made by Electronic Arts for their own use. Uh, so it's as pretty much the same API, but it's way more, uh, you know, performance aware, compile time aware, and memory usage uh, aware. Um, exceptions are also something that is pretty much banned, um, again, both for performance reason and compile time as well. I will claim uh, runtime type information. It's pretty much a no-go. You're adding a lot of uh, info that most of the time you don't really need. There's a bazillion of strings that will go into your uh, executable. It's super limited, uh, and it will be just a gift for uh, for uh, for hackers or cheaters because they can just go and find a lot of additional info in your uh, in, in your binary. Um, and there's also a lot of, uh, you know, not invented here syndrome in the game industry. Uh, I, I think it comes from the fact that we make our own tools, so we just think like, yeah, we should make even our own libraries and stuff like that. Um, Boost is used somewhere, but again, Boost is, I, I think it's a beautiful uh, exercise in proving what you can do with the language more than something that you should do. Uh, that's my that's my take on uh, on on it. Uh, but even when it comes to using open source libraries, it's very very restricted. I mean, sure, someone is linking uh, I don't know uh, OpenSSL or a Zlib library for compression stuff like that. But it's very very rare that you will see anything else or any general purpose library uh, being uh, being used pretty much. Um, there's a lot of uh, do it yourself. Um, meaning there's a lot of things that pretty much every single engine or every single game company read us uh, because unfortunately it's not in the language or it's not in the language yet or it's not in the language in a, in a decent form. Reflection is probably the, 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 the first one. Every single company out there has its own reflection system, either macros or uh, some kind of tooling to pre-parse the, the source code. Everyone does that, and usually you uh, couple that with code generation, right? If you're doing, if you have a reflection system, usually you do serialization and deserialization, so you want to uh, generate the code for those, uh, you know, for those methods uh, there. Um, a thing that is being done a lot these days because, um, uh, you know, uh, the uh, data-oriented design is becoming the new, the new religion in uh, in game development is a structure of arrays. Uh, there's no built-in support in, in C++ for basically virtualize, you know, abstracting between structure of arrays and arrays of structures. 
since the memory access is pretty much the things that dominates performance on, uh, on, uh, on, on the CPUs we, we use this day, people end up basically implementing their own, uh, you know, template magic to, to try to do those things, to do those things that probably the, ideally the language should do for, uh, for you. Uh, hot reloading is another one. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a very iterative process making games. Uh, and uh, it's it's not nice when you seeing something on screen and you notice a small mistake, you want to change it, and it means shutting down the engine, recompiling, uh, restarting it again, and, and wasting minutes and minutes. Um, so most companies either use a middleware to to add hot reloading capabilities or build their own uh, their own thing. Um, garbage collection, which might sound surprising because like hey, you're, you're talking about performance and then you talk about garbage collection. Uh, as I said, uh, performance matter mostly where it matters, meaning uh, there's a tiny subset of code that you really want to be obsessed about performance, and then there's a lot of other area where you can be kind of lazy. Uh, you know, scripting languages or all those kind of things, it's fine if they run on a, on a virtual machine or are garbage collected. I mean, even the core of Unreal, uh, every time you're using a big an actor in Unreal, it is pretty much a new object, which is something that is garbage uh, collected. And um, last but not least, this is, um, this is a new thing, well, new, last 10 years, pretty much. Um, every single engine out there or every large company has basically been building its own uh, task library or graph library um, as a way to basically control uh, concurrency, pretty, pretty much. Uh, now there are coroutines in the, in the standard, but again, uh, the, the wall, uh, the, the usual interaction between memory allocation and, uh, and standard library doesn't really play nicely with the existing uh, code bases for, uh, for games and the requirements for games. So we tend to stay, uh, to stand, to stay away from, uh, from those. Now, some of the you know, things I love or the things I don't like from, uh, from the, the language in this specific uh, context. I mean, the good one is that C++ is still the dominant language for the industry. So if you're thinking of going into the, the you know, into making games, it's a, it's a very good bet to, to learn the language and know the, 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 the language. Um, it's improving, uh, you know, not, not as quickly as other languages, but I would claim it's still improving at a decent pace. Um, probably they, stu they should start also removing stuff instead of just adding, but you know, maybe I'm, I'm digressing there. But all in all, I think it's still a language that lets you do efficient things uh, easily. Uh, of course, if you know how to use it. Some other languages, you know, sometimes they get into your way. They, they try to protect you a little bit too much. So sometimes they just get into your way. Um, the bad things about the language, um, I mean, these are very common known uh, thing. Uh, memory uh, unsafety uh, is a thing. Uh, now, um, there's a very famous talk uh, from, uh, I don't remember his name right now, but very famous computer scientist. His talk is, uh, is titled The Billion Dollar Mistake, something like that. The guy goes like, well, I, I, I invented null pointers and that was a, a disaster because, uh, you know, of all the problems that, uh, that it's causing. Um, now, in, in reality, for, for the game industry, we, we do a lot of debugging. We do a lot of uh, pretty much run with a debugger attached all the time. So uh, null pointers are actually not an issue. It's, it's usually things that we, we catch very, very easily, very early on. You know, you get a hardware uh, break immediately, you know exactly what pointer was being referenced. So null pointers are not really a, a bad thing. The real problem is memory trashing. It's when you're leaving a dangling pointer and now you're accessing something that you are not supposed to access, and then you start to, you know, trash your memory and you, you have no idea how that's, uh, that's done. Um, again, it's bad, but it's not terrible, uh, meaning we have learned over the years to, to, to write a lot of custom allocators and tools that basically record everything that is going on with memory. So these problems are, are not, you know, they're not nice to, to, to debug, but they're not the end of the world. Uh, they, you know, you, most people in a company, they know how to, to find this, uh, this, uh, these things. What's really bad is unsafe concurrency, because that's, uh, when you couple the two things, Sometimes you get this memory stomping that are very, very hard to, to debug and, and figure out what, what happens. Uh, I will claim there's a lot of uh, these bugs that are basically just lingering in our code bases. They don't manifest just because consoles are very predictable hardware. You know, they have a very specific amount of cores. They run at a very specific pace. 
But then the moment you bring these games to PC and you have more number of cores or more variety in your hardware, all sorts of nasty things starts to, 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 to show up. And um, it's very hard to debug these things. I will claim that you know, it's, it's less than 1% of your, uh, of your coders that can, uh, can, can figure out what those problems, uh, you know, to, to find those bugs. Sometimes it takes, uh, it takes weeks, if not even months, to really do this bug, debug those things. So that's, uh, that's nasty. Um, and then there's the, what I, you know, these are the, the three uh, horrible, horrible problems in, uh, in C++. Uh, first one is compile times, the second one is compile times, and the third one is compile times. If you were at Vittorio presentation before, uh, you probably know already what, uh, what I'm talking about. The point is we do all those things and still compile times are pretty much horrible. It's just, it is an issue with the language that should definitely be uh, addressed. Um, again, as Vittorio said, yeah, we can look at the uh, modules, but reality is modules are not ready. I did mistakes of trying uh, being an early adopter for modules and it's, they're, they're nowhere near being usable in my, in my, in my view. And it's going to take decades to even convert existing code bases to embrace, uh, to embrace modules. Um, this is a specific uh, use case uh, that I wanted to, to mention. This is from the uh, Glacier engine. It's the engine used to do, to do Hitman. Again, this, this uh, capture is from a couple of years ago, but you know, we're looking at a code base of around 3 million lines of code. And um, once you start measuring how much of those lines are in headers and how much are in uh, sources, you know, you start getting this very shocking, you know, it's very, there's a lot of code in, uh, in headers. Um, now, again, this is even after you apply most of the uh, low hanging fruit optimization that you, that you can, because compilers are good, but they are still not as good as, you know, compiler people uh, uh, tell us. Uh, so you end up having to put a lot of things in headers just to make performance really, really, you know, be there. Uh, lean time optimization, uh, uh, you know, profile guided optimization, all those things, they, mm, they get you further, but they're not really viable in a day to day. They just make the iteration too, too, too slow, pretty much. So you end up doing a lot of this. Um, even if you just look at gameplay code, uh, you know, all gameplay in a, in a Hitman game is actually in a DLL called Hitman. And, um, on average, you know, length of files is, is not too bad. I think that's uh, that's that's uh, manageable. But even once you do the ratio, you you start seeing that there's just too many code in uh, in uh, in headers. And this is a very unscientific, but I think it proves a, a point. If you we did this exercise of basically measuring compile times for each CPP um, and measuring how many headers were included either directly or indirectly from that file. Now, it's a very brute and crude measurement because you, you can have headers that are large, headers that are small, and so forth. But still, you can see a very clear linear correlation there. Okay, it's, it's pretty much obvious that including headers and having to parse and reparse and reanalyze and recompile and redo all those things all the time, it's the real core of the, of the, of the problem that, um, again, I hope gets addressed uh, eventually. Um, let's talk about the, the future of C++ in, uh, in, uh, in game development. Let's, uh, let's do some, uh, you know, five to ten years predictions. So, the elephant in the room uh, in, uh, you know, many C++ conferences, people even hate when people uh, mention that name, but I think it's, it's something that we need to do. Of course, it's this, you know, the little, uh, the little crab uh, there. Um, it is solving some of those ugly problems that I mentioned uh, before. So it might feel natural like, ah, okay, this is actually something that is uh, solving your, uh, your biggest problem. Now, you know, jokes aside, uh, I think there's an even larger elephant in the room, which is AI. Generative AI is uh, getting shockingly good, shockingly fast. Um, I remember when I first had access to to, to a GPT, um, I ran a technical interview. Basically, I interview the AI in the same way as I interview coders when we, when we get them in the company. And, um, and I was like, yeah, I mean, this guy can go and make web pages. And then a few months later, I, I did it again with a newer version. And uh, last time it was only three months ago with ChatGPT. 
And it was shocking. It was just like, okay, this guy might not be able to do architecture, but as a, as a junior or as a, you know, intermediate programmer with a little bit of a, an autistic flail or, you know, not fully able, to, I mean, in a good sense, meaning, you know, sometimes you have to repeat the same things multiple times uh, to make them understand. So there is clearly still some uh, understanding missing, but the speed at which, uh, you know, they have been improving, it's, it's, it is quite shocking. So I don't think it's a, outrageous to predict that a large part of, uh, you know, low level uh, coding, both for games and for all other industry might be, might be completely replaced from, uh, from these things. Now, I personally hope that they will only be used to generate code and then the code will still be compiled because I think letting an AI generate and run their own code, it's a recipe for disasters. Uh, you know, Terminator style kind of disasters, but it is a, it is a fact. Said so, let's just ignore that for now and let's get back to the, to the whole uh, Rust, uh, Rust point. Uh, as I said, Rust is definitely addressing some of the main issue uh, that we as uh, C++ developers in the game industry uh, have. Uh, but it's also a language where if you try to make a doubly linked list, you, will, uh, you, know, you need to go to unsafe land to do, to do certain uh, uh, easy things. Uh, it forces you to, I, I will actually claim that uh, it forces you to think in a in a different way that it's beneficial even if you then go back and write in C++. So I always encourage people to learn Rust no matter uh, no matter what. But again, will we replace C++ in, uh, in games? Um, I think yes, but not anytime soon, to be honest. Uh, first of all, I think the ecosystem for the for the competitor is just not there. Uh, I mean, first of all, compile times in Rust are even worse than C++. So it's really not addressing, you know, problem number one. Uh, I mean, good luck uh, debugging, but, you know, debugging for real, not like printf debugging uh, a large, uh, large program in, in Rust. You know, you, you just give up. I, I, I check that every six months and every six months I'm just disappointed, but, uh, you know, by, by what happens uh, there. There is a game studio that is actually leading the, the charge there. It's a fairly big studio. Um, they're writing a new engine and new game completely in Rust. But again, they're pragmatic. So their next two games, they're shipping on Unreal, right? It's also a symptom that they want to be early adopters, but the tech is no, nowhere near, uh, you know, close to be ready for, uh, for release. So again, if you're planning to get into the game industry for the, first, for the next five, 10 years uh, as a C++ programmer, I think you're safe. So do, you know, learn the language and, uh, and, and come there. And um, we're pretty much done with time, but luckily we're also done with the, with the talk. So that's, uh, that's all. And, we can uh, switch to, to question. Thank you, guys. Yeah, I will repeat the questions, if there are questions. Yes, so the question, I mean, first there was a comment about Rust not being there. We fully agree. Um, and um, the question was about your experience with modules. Um, so again, as I said, we are mostly visual. Uh, visual, uh, well, presentation is gone. Uh, we are a Visual Studio environment. Uh, supports for modules in Visual Studio uh, has been there for a couple of years already now. Uh, but we've basically been bump we, we've done a pilot, okay? So it's it's very hard to imagine uh, taking uh, three million lines of code and switching to modules in a, in a day one. So I've done a pilot on a on a on a smaller code base, uh, you know, doing some of the same things. Um, again, I can't um, from the top of my head. Uh, you rebuild way more frequently. Uh, than it actually is, so I think that the proper tracking of dependency is still not there, right? The the the, the um, you know the standard went for basically giving the ability of naming a modules however you want instead of identifying no modules through file names. So if you think about that, you have to basically scan all the modules just to know what's their name, 
to find out uh, who's using uh, who's using what. So in my experience, we were seeing a lot of recompiling over and over again, even stuff that hasn't really changed. Uh, there's module private, you know, all the all those uh, means to actually split between what's the public interface, which is supposed to be the thing that you don't change or, you know, that triggers a recompilation versus the thing that it's private that you should be able to freely change. No, I mean, most of the time, even where you're changing a module implementation or private section of module will be recompiling a lot of uh, things. Uh, it broke a lot of the, um, 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 you know, um, templates, uh, picking the right specialization and all that kind of stuff that has been fixed recently, but back in the early days, Basically, uh, yeah, all these specializations were uh, were, you know, not really not really picked up, not the correct ones. Uh, other stuff, the support for the STL as a module is still in experimental. You know, it's 2023, uh, three years later, it's still fully in experimental uh, mode. So again, all in all, it just didn't feel like it's uh, it's ready for uh, to be used. Now, Microsoft is a large corporation, but when I file bugs about this stuff, it seems like there's only one guy <laughs> answering to this. So um, I'm afraid that there might actually be one guy working on module set. Uh, maybe it's not the case, but from the outside, it feels like that. So it is a little bit uh, worrying. Again, it has been improving, but not at the speed that I would have loved or at the speed that, you know, would be needed for, uh, for mass, uh, mass adoption. Sorry, say again. Oh, uh, so question was, uh, uh, what is the game that you've been uh, mostly enjoying working on and, uh, and why? Um, again, in my career kind of started from the bottom and then I've, I've bubbled up. So for the past five years, I've actually shipped more titles, but not really working directly. It was more, uh, you know, guiding, uh, guiding other people. Uh, so the, the fun part was, you know, the first five years where you actually work uh, as an engineer on, uh, on things. Uh, Hitman Absolution is clearly my, my, my favorite because I was, uh, I was part of the engine team back in those, uh, those days. And in the game industry, there's really a line between uh, game and tech coders and, uh, and gameplay game people, right? We, we almost look at each other with a little bit of a confrontational eye and, uh, and so forth. Because, uh, you know, tech people, they're more thinking long-term. They want to do stuff in the proper way, small, but that will last for decades. Gameplay programmers are more like, man, I need uh, something on screen uh, yeah, yesterday, not even, uh, not even uh, today. So there, there's definitely different, uh, different requirements there. So I really love my time on Hitman Absolution because I was forced to switch between the two. Uh, back in those days, the the company was struggling to get that game out where there are a lot of people quitting and so the gameplay team was drying up so the technical director back then came to the engine uh, team and he, he was basically looking for volunteers he was looking at us and uh, I, I was i was young and and stupid so i made eye contact Everyone else was just uh, looking around on uh, typing on their own keyboard. I, I made this mistake of making guy contact and the guy goes like, ah, Maurizio, I know that you play game. Why don't you move to the gameplay team? And, uh, and I go like, yeah, but I, I don't know those, uh, those things. Uh, just try it out for a couple of months. And um, uh, it ended up being enlightening because you finally see uh, the tech that you're making from the other side as a user. And now you understand why gameplay programmers were, uh, uh, you know, bitching about certain things or uh, wanted things to be done differently and so forth. So since then, I always recommend people to, um, sure, specialize, become a, a master in your craft, but try other things as well. Uh, go out of your comfort zone because it's 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 eye opening. It's really it makes you, uh, you know, even better at your own uh, uh, domain if you get to see get a chance to see how your domain is used from, uh, from, from the other sides, pretty much. So yeah, Absolution is my, one of my fondest memories because as of today, every time you see someone moving in a Hitman game, it's still running on code that I wrote back in those days 10 years ago. So it's, uh, it's, it's I mean, even bugs included. So even if you see them uh, doing weird stuff, it's uh, still uh, fond, uh, fond memories. Can you raise the voice a little bit? 
oh, what is the best way? Question is, what is the best way to enter in the game industry? So the game industry, there's this uh, joke, which is a little bit like, uh, uh, you know, Fight Club. Uh, you know, the scene where uh, they show up at the door and they go like, ah, you're too blonde or you're too tall or you're too short. Game industry is the same. If you go online and if you look for a job application, it always say a minimum one year of experience, a minimum one ship title. It's not true. It's not true. We hire, we hire our smart people. That's it. If you're smart, even if you don't have the knowledge, because knowledge can be acquired, smarts are a little bit harder to, 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 to acquire. Uh, so, um, of course, you know, um, having, uh, having your small game on GitHub or having your small prototype or playing around with those things helps a lot. But it's not really strictly a requirement. So to get in the game industry, you literally just send, a, send your CV. Uh, it's as easy as, uh, as that. Um, there's a desperate need for people because talent is extremely scarce. Uh, so there's, um, yeah, I mean, job posting will, will claim like, oh, minimum three titles shipped. It's not true. Just apply. Uh, people will get back to you. Uh, again, one of the slides uh, that for some reason doesn't show up on the screen anymore, it's my, let me see if I can bring it to this site. Yeah. Again, find me on LinkedIn, send me a mail, uh, contact me. If, you, if you're curious about the game industry or want to uh, tell me what you have done and what type of games you like, I can point you to literally studios that might be uh, you know, willing to, to talk to you or that might be a good fit, both in Italy and, uh, and abroad. The Italian gaming industry is also, it's, it's lifting. Uh, there's more and more studios that are doing things that it's starting to look pretty cool. They still classify themselves as double A, but I think we're getting close to that, you know, breaching that double A, triple A uh, boundary. So, um, and it, it is a very interesting job, meaning you don't get as paid as much as you will do at Google or uh, banking or something like that, but you will have a lot of fun. That I can uh, promise you that there's a lot of uh, interesting uh, challenges and problems and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. You even play games, not all the time, but you play games. <laughs> Oh, uh, so question is, uh, can you do a good, bad and ugly of the game industry, uh, not of the languages? Um, I mean, the good is what I just said. It's a lot of fun. Uh, you work on projects that really make an impact. Uh, you make happy a lot of people, I would claim. Uh, I mean, we are not saving lives, but we're making uh, some people's life better by giving them fun and enjoyment. And, and so forth. So it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, it's a very nice uh, working environment. Uh, you know, I, I probably you know I wear shorts most of the time. I put this long jeans just for the for the occasion. You will never be asked to to wear a suit or anything like that. Actually, quite the opposite. Sometimes we do formal Fridays where we dress formally just to <laughs> just to break the you know the common path. Uh, the ugly. It is a young uh, industry. It's still very shockingly inexperienced. Many of the people that are running game studios or game productions, they haven't really studied for that. They were just, you know, they learned on the by by doing it. And sometimes they haven't really learned by doing it. So uh, there's a lot of inefficiency. There's a lot of uh, weird processes and uh, and stuff like that. That can be frustrating. Um, that's probably the ugly, not the bad. Uh, the bad is. Um, yeah, I don't know. Again, I'll just give you a, a plus and a minus. Uh... Yeah, uh, what is the technology? Yeah, grab me in the grab me in the corridors. I mean, I'm happy to 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 talk with all you guys. And thank you for being here. Thank you.